bison, the incomparable, unparalleled, and unequivocal embodiment of U.S. wilderness. Once numbering in the tens of millions throughout North America, the population of wild bison is now less than 1% of what it was in centuries past. What kind of effect did the millions of bison of the past have on North America versus the 400,000 or so alive today? Should this iconic species be brought back to its full form and reintroduced to its native lands? What kind of issues may arise and what will reintroducing bison do for the deteriorating soil and natural lands of America? Not only will all of these questions be answered throughout the video, but I will also provide context with fascinating information crucial for you to better understand the overall state of affairs between humans and nature in America. So without further ado, let's dive deep into the physical and metaphorical giant of America, the bison. Let's freaking go. The American Plains Bison is the national mammal of the United States of America and by far the most iconic animal in American history. Its scientific name is Bison Bison. About 5,000 years ago, the species Bison Bison evolved from a lineage of larger prehistoric bison species known as Bison Priscus, Bison Latifrons, and Bison Antiquus. Although evolution has made it smaller than it was in the past, the American Plains Bison, or Bison Bison, is still very large. With adult bulls weighing around 2,000 pounds, the Plains Bison is the largest land mammal in all of North America. A mere two centuries ago, there were so many Plains Bison in North America that there are no 100% accurate predictions as to how many of them there were. Estimates range from a staggering 25 to 32 million bison occupying the interior of the continent from northwestern Canada all the way down to Florida, Texas, and Mexico. This incredible book titled American Serengeti, The Last Big Animals of the Great Plains by A.B. Hammond, Professor Emeritus at the University of Montana, Dan Flores, contains fascinating information about the history of the Plains Bison. It's mentioned in the book that renowned naturalist John James Audubon wrote this in his journal as he was traveling up the Missouri River. These animals are abundant beyond belief hereabouts. In fact, it is impossible to describe or even conceive the vast multitudes of these animals that exist even now and feed on these ocean-like prairies. It was the early 1840s when the legendary John James Audubon wrote that in his journal. A time when a bison herd migrating through your camp on the Great Plains could take days to pass through. The Great Plains of North America were filled to the brim with bison. There were oceans of these animals. Each adult bison, excluding some of the smaller females, weighs over a thousand pounds, with some of the largest bulls weighing around the vicinity of a ton. With tens of millions of animals that large, foraging almost constantly on the prairie, their impact on nature was massive. Hundreds of different species depended on their existence and how they molded the ecosystems of the great American landscape, including humans. Indigenous peoples of North America depended on the bison not only for food and clothing, but for about a hundred more reasons, from making war shields out of bison rawhide to beds, blankets, and pillows with tanned bison hide and hair. The bison provided natives with virtually everything. It was an animal that came with such an abundance of resources that the indigenous peoples developed a great respect for it. Many tribes included bison in their songs, artworks, and religious events. Think of it this way. For a native family in North America in the 1700s, successfully hunting a bison was like what a trip to Walmart is for a family in modern civilization. The natives could stock their entire homes full of food, tools, and other goods all from this one animal. In fact, the homes themselves could be built from bison bones, hides, and other parts. Throughout the 19th century, European American settlers expanded westward across the continent, hunting bison, elk, pronghorn, mule deer, grizzly bears, wolves, coyotes, foxes, beavers, and basically any wild animal with a heartbeat that was within range, and there were no restrictions. In the early 1800s, a new, huge market in the economy emerged, the animal market. Buffalo robes made from the bison's thick winter hides were especially a hot commodity. The number of megafauna killed by American settlers, along with wealthy trophy hunters from overseas, is staggering. A single person would kill dozens of bison in one day, leaving the meat to rot. Even ordinary people would shoot bison out of moving trains for the fun of it. At the time, it was hard for people to believe that these great herds of bison could ever vanish. Thus, the 19th century was an absolute bloodbath for North American wildlife. 
This extreme rate of killing decreased the once unfathomable numbers of the American Plains Bison with such rapidity that the species was found on the brink of extinction by the late 1800s. By 1886, bison numbers were brought down from an estimated 25 to 32 million to around 1,000. Just trying to visualize that and imagining the sheer amount of killing required to push an animal from millions to hundreds in the span of just one century makes my head hurt. The 19th century Great Plains, along with parts of Africa, were slaughterhouses for native wildlife. This bloody century is a prime example of the sixth mass extinction referred to by scientists as the Anthropocene in full effect. Toward the end of the 19th century, most of the bison across the continent had been massacred by European American hunters, certain indigenous hunters, climate fluctuations, diseases, and grazing competition from the rapidly growing wild horse populations. Thanks to founders of the American Bison Society, such as William T. Hornaday and Theodore Roosevelt, as well as the modern conservation movement initiated in the early 1900s, small herds of bison were spared and even reintroduced into certain pockets of land in Yellowstone National Park and northwestern Montana. It was from those micropopulations that conservationists and ranchers began increasing their numbers starting around the beginning of the 20th century. Hunters were prohibited from killing bison in the uncontrolled manner in which they were. Various conservation efforts as well as ranchers that bred bison helped manage the partial return of the American Plains bison. Today, there are about 430,000 bison in North America. However, most of these bison that are alive in North America today have cattle genes, partly due to efforts for hybridization between wild bison and domestic cows that took place in the early 1900s. They're not 100% bison, they're part cow. Out of the 430,000 or so bison alive in North America today, only about 5% of them are genetically pure plains bison. This tiny percentage represents the only bison on the continent that are genetically pure bison. In total, there are around 25,000 genetically pure bison in North America today, with the largest herds roaming the valleys of Yellowstone National Park, just as they did during prehistoric times. Thus, 95% of the bison in North America today are not genetically pure plains bison. They are partially cows, tens of thousands of genetically modified hybrid animals. Genetically pure bison can be found living in Wind Cave National Park as well, and a few other very small populations of genetically pure bison are scattered throughout the lower 48. There are also a few herds of pure bison roaming the wilderness of northwestern Canada and parts of Alaska known as wood bison. Once thought to be a different species entirely, DNA studies suggest that wood bison are a subspecies of the plains bison. Humans came very close to pushing bison to extinction. I am beyond grateful that a population of 100% plains bison still remains, even if it is less than 1% of its natural size. At least there's something to work with, a starting point. Ah, God, my toe, my toe. Oh. Yeah, I'm kind of new to this whole YouTube thing. But anyways, what's up guys and welcome back to Wild Primal. If you're new here, my name is Sadat Faiz and I'm a writer, artist, and a conservationist as well as the author of this book, Iconic Animals of the North, a fact-filled exploration of northern wildlife. If it's your first time watching a Wild Primal video, Wild Primal is a channel focused on wildlife and how we can help support the natural world in various ways, namely through supporting regenerative agriculture. Um, I hope that this video is opening your eyes to the impact bison have on the American landscape and, and I hope that it's motivating you to help support nature, whether that be choosing what you buy, choosing what you eat, which companies you support, or donating money to organizations that help native wildlife and ecosystems or even something as simple as liking this video to, to raise awareness about how, how badly we need bison in the ecology of North America, or even sharing this video to people who might not know too much about what's going on in, in the natural world. So thanks for clicking my video, I, I truly appreciate it. Please tap the like button if you're enjoying it so far as it really helps support the channel and, uh, and it really does help my video get more views and reach the right people. Tapping that like button is how you can let the YouTube algorithm know that this video needs to be seen. Um, leave some comments and uh, feel free to check out my gray wolf video which is up on the channel right now if you want to be notified when I release my next video which will be on the infamous brown bear grizzly bear is a subspecies of brown bear by the way uh, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell button make sure you subscribe and hit the bell button um, or else or else you won't you won't be notified think about it I could be getting millions and millions of views and you wouldn't even know it so if you want to be notified make sure you tap that bell button make sure you tap that bell button make sure you tap that bell button so if you want to be notified make sure you tap that bell button tap that bell button
Gonna tap that bell button, tap that bell button, tap that tap. Make sure you tap that bell button. Make sure you tap that bell button. Now back to the video. I mentioned how bison spend their days in the wild in my book, Iconic Animals of the North, a fact-filled exploration of northern wildlife. I'll share that snippet now. In the wild, the American bison's life is simple. A large quantity of plant matter is needed to fuel their bodies, so they spend most of their days grazing. They don't require any form of shelter in the wild and are content sleeping right on the ground throughout all four seasons. To relieve their skin of parasites, they perform the act of wallowing. It's basically a dust bath. They'll roll their massive bodies on dry land, rubbing their skin on the dirt. This also helps bison shed their coats during spring. A large, healthy bull isn't concerned about predators, since he's strong enough to render them airborne with a single thrust of his head. To avoid getting injured, predators usually target weakened or young bison. During the rut, bulls release guttural sounds and forcibly butt heads with each other as they compete for the right to mate. Bison calves must rely on the protection of their mothers. Herds sometimes surround calves to keep them inaccessible to predators. I hope you enjoyed that brief extract from my book, Iconic Animals of the North, a fact-filled exploration of northern wildlife. It took me about seven and a half months to write and design this book, and I've never spent more effort on creating something to date. Like all authors, I poured hours upon hours of research, writing, rewriting, and graphical designing into the creation of this book. I didn't outsource anything since this is the first product I've ever released. I painted the cover myself on an iPad with an Apple Pencil. The cover alone took me about 14 hours total to paint from scratch. I'm glad I spent as much time as I did on the cover, as I think it looks quite nice on the coffee table. Apart from liking the video and leaving a comment, purchasing a copy of my self-published book, whether it's the paperback, hardcover, or ebook version, is yet another way to help support me and this YouTube channel to spread the message of preserving and connecting with nature. Thank you from the bottom of my heart if you bought yourself a copy of Iconic Animals of the North, a fact-filled exploration of northern wildlife. Anyways, let's jump back to what bison do in the wild. The way bison herds defend their young from predators fascinates me. It makes me think of Earth's Cretaceous period, when Triceratops groups may have defended their young from T. rexes by forming an impenetrable wall of armored heads and lethal horns. The huge cape buffaloes of Africa have been known to employ a similar defense method against lions and hyenas. Today's megafauna may not be as large and dangerous as dinosaurs, but that doesn't mean they're not large and dangerous. When I went to Yellowstone National Park and saw bison from only yards away, I realized how little pictures and videos of these behemoths do to capture their actual size. I drove past many bison, some of which were wallowing on the ground just yards from my car, showcasing their immense size. On top of cleaning their fur of parasites, wallowing is also done by bulls in particular to accentuate how big and powerful they are. If two male bison are wallowing in close enough proximity to each other and it's the breeding season, a brutal fight is sure to follow. The breeding season for certain ungulates, including bison, is known as the rut. The rut can get pretty barbaric, with bulls violently competing for female bison, which are referred to as cows. The bison rut lasts from mid-July through September in Yellowstone National Park. During this time, hundreds of bulls kick up clouds of dust as they smash their heads with one another with incredible force. While competing, their motive is to gore their opponent with their massive horns. Friendly reminder to not approach these guys in Yellowstone or anywhere where they aren't behind a strong fence. Unless, of course, you want to get yeeted 10 feet into a tree. Only the victors of these brutal competitions will get to spread their genes throughout the herd and father many calves in the spring season. This is a prime example of natural selection at work. During the rut, bulls will also scent mark the land with their urine to make their presence known, often wallowing right where they left their scent mark, covering themselves with the scent of their urine and testosterone. Multiple males scent marking too close to each other may start a brawl. During my time at Yellowstone, another thing I noticed the bulls doing during the rut is raising their heads up and making these low, rumbling, guttural bellows. It sounded like a deep and loud roar. It's mentioned in this article published by NPS.gov that these bellows have been compared to revving up an old Chevy truck. It is believed that these bellows announce the male's presence and establish dominance within the herd. I can attest that they sound pretty gnarly. Bison can eat over 20 pounds of plant matter a day, and their selective grazing habits do wonders for prairie ecosystems. These generalist foragers love to eat blue grama, sand drop seed, and little blue stem. And unlike cattle, bison don't eat grass down to the roots. Domestic cows do eat down to the roots, causing the grass a long time to recover or even die. 
bison only eat the top part and move on, because they literally can't curl their lips as far back as cattle can. This kind of unique selective grazing by bison results in grazed and ungrazed patches on the grassland, which promotes the overall health of the prairie ecosystem by increasing the nutrient content of grasses and promoting plant biodiversity on the prairie. This has been proven by tests done on grasslands where bison were introduced. As time goes on and more and more knowledge and data on the science of ecology piles up, we are learning that there are even more benefits and deeper influences that native wildlife such as bison have on the American landscape that increase species richness and abundance. For instance, the bison's tendency to just eat the top part and move on creates large patches of short grass on the prairie. Certain bird species, such as the chestnut collared longspur, need these areas of short grass to breed properly. I find that quite fascinating. Also, bison spread seeds in their manure over long distances and maintain natural open spaces. They don't allow trees and woody plants to cover up grasslands and prairies. Trees are great, don't get me wrong, but grasslands and prairies are essential ecosystems in their own right. This is one of the reasons bison are being reintroduced to their native lands in America and in Poland's Białowieża forest. The presence of the European bison, or the Wysant as it is called, will positively affect the ecosystems of Europe for generations to come. What's really interesting about bison, in North America at least, is that when they wallow on the ground, either to clean their fur of parasites or display their size and power, they are also doing a great service for the natural world. You see, when a 2,000 pound animal takes a dust bath, repeatedly rolling its massive body around on the dirt, it doesn't take too long for a slight depression to form on the ground where the wallowing is taking place. Next thing you know, there's a micro depression on the ground where a big bull was wallowing. In areas with bison, these micro depressions appear throughout the land and end up collecting water when it rains, turning into little ponds. These ponds act as water holes for other species, like toads and salamanders. These little bison-made ponds also do wonders for the grass surrounding the ponds. The soil around the ponds gets soaked with water which the grasses really benefit from as their root systems have access to a constant supply of water. The grasses surrounding the microponds end up growing taller than the rest of the grasses on the prairie, allowing numerous animal species to create nests and shelters in them and form their own tiny habitats. Who wouldn't want to stumble upon a small pond hidden by tall grasses and home to all kinds of wonderful animals? These ponds seem like they're straight out of a fairy tale, with all kinds of birds, butterflies, chipmunks, and amphibians flying, scurrying, and crawling about. Obviously, for bison penned up in an area not large enough to support their numbers, wallowing may not do anything to help the environment, but for well-managed bison with enough pasture and natural land to roam, wallowing is absolutely wonderful for the ecology of that land because it creates these microponds that directly support bison biodiversity. Our Great Plains would thrive from having more genetically pure bison foraging on them. To naturally function at their highest capacity, these types of ecosystems, grasslands and prairies, need healthy populations of herbivores to forage almost constantly. The bison of the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Oklahoma forage for up to 11 hours a day. It's not just the dispersal of seeds, but also how they are being dispersed in the animal's mineral-rich manure. This natural system acts as the lifeblood of grasslands and prairies. The manure gives the seeds a huge head start in life, allowing them to grow naturally into vibrant, healthy, wild plants that are part of an ecosystem. I was able to witness this firsthand when I was hiking in Utah's Antelope Island State Park. I saw bison out in the open for the first time in my life at this state park while I was traveling all throughout the USA in 2021. As I was hiking shirtless in Utah, Sweat beating on my body underneath the afternoon sun, lugging my backpack through vast stretches of open land, I happened upon a thick, frisbee-shaped pile of dried bison manure, or as Westerners refer to as a buffalo chip. I inspected it closely. I gave it a kick. Underneath, I noticed many small green blades of grass sprouting out of the ground. The fact that they were growing so well, even without much water, seemed quite remarkable to me. I realized I was witnessing an ecosystem literally rebuilding itself from the manure of its largest organism, the American Plains Bison. In the wild, bison like to travel in large herds. It's in their DNA. In chapter 3 of Dan Flores' most recently published book, Wild New World, he states, Like many prey animals, bison evolved to be highly social herd creatures. Numbers mean lots of eyes on predators and enhanced chances you're not the target. Bison ranchers have described their movement as very synchronized, almost as if the entire bison herd is one organism, like a colony of bees or a school of fish. 
and when bison die, they provide an absolute buffet for predators and scavengers. One dead bison can feed foxes, coyotes, bears, wolves, raccoons, skunks, badgers, numerous bird species, and much more. The meat eaters of a habitat may not have to worry about finding meat for days, sometimes even weeks if they can find a dead bison carcass. They'll keep returning to it to feed, filling their bellies with much needed meals. This may prevent them from rummaging around for food near civilization and decrease conflict with humans. In his book, American Buffalo, In Search of a Lost Icon, American conservationist and hunter Stephen Ranella explained how in the past, when there were millions of bison, many of them would die simultaneously from natural causes such as tornadoes, earthquakes, and flooding. Sometimes rivers would be littered with hundreds of dead bison. These rivers carried thousands of bison bodies and provided grizzly bears and other omnivores with a seemingly endless supply of meat. This also boosted the river's ecology by introducing tons of new nutrients from the decomposing carcasses. These mass bison deaths happened consistently every year, and it reminds me of the annual salmon migrations that bears in Alaska depend on to gain enough weight for hibernation. Imagine being a hungry bear or a fox and seeing hundreds of bison carcasses, sometimes thousands, floating down the river. It's basically cloudy with a chance of meatballs. Wilderness edition. For a rare moment, these predators could stuff themselves for days, and it was all thanks to the presence of healthy bison populations numbering in the millions. Also, another thing bison do to support their ecosystems is mentioned in Chapter 9 of American Buffalo in Search of a Lost Icon. Stephen Ranella says, In areas that now contain buffalo, researchers have found that one-third of all nesting birds use buffalo wool to line their nests. The wool is also hoarded by rodents such as mice and voles. Even birds and mice construct their shelters using bison parts. As you can see, bison positively impact their habitat by promoting biodiversity in fascinating ways. Before I dive into the last section, I'd like to thank you for watching this far into the video. I'd also like to ask you to please tap the like button, as it really helps the algorithm push my videos to more and more viewers. If you're enjoying it, why not help spread this important information to more people with a simple tap on your screen. And if you choose to subscribe, don't forget to hit the bell button because if you don't, the odds of you seeing my next video, which I'm currently working on, are slim to none. Think of hitting the subscribe button as bookmarking my channel. If you want to truly subscribe, you gotta hit that bell button because there is a lot of competition on YouTube. So thank you from the bottom of my heart if you liked and subscribed to Wild Primal. Now let's get back to the video. With the anarchic past between humans and wildlife in America over the past three centuries, I'm glad to announce that the future is looking bright for native wildlife in a number of ways. You see, I always thought that I had been born at the wrong time. A time when nature is being destroyed all throughout the world, everywhere I look, with pollution, deforestation, and species loss. If only I could be born in the early 20th century like David Attenborough, I'd think to myself, I would have become a wildlife biologist and explored incredible virgin lands throughout the planet, teeming with animals, just as he did as a young naturalist. But I now realize that 2023 is a very exciting time for naturalists, ecologists, and honestly all types of environmentalists. Despite the environmental destruction going on, there are so many exciting projects with sky-high potential in the works right now to help rewild and revive the natural landscape along with its ecology. One of these projects is being done by American Prairie, an independent nonprofit organization in Montana. American Prairie plans to create a massive nature reserve right here in America. The organization has been purchasing large swaths of Montana public and private lands adjacent to each other and piecing them together to eventually form one huge expanse of land in central Montana. Their goal is to acquire 3.2 million acres of land. Once the goal is reached, American Prairie's nature reserve will be the largest wildlife reserve in the lower 48 by far. 3.2 million acres, which is around 5,000 square miles, is roughly the size of the entire state of Connecticut. It's nearly the size of Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park combined. This preserve, once completed, would put Jurassic Park to shame in terms of sheer scale. Not only are thousands of genetically pure bison being reintroduced into this reserve by American prairie, but a host of other species are being brought back as well to recreate the shortgrass prairie ecosystem in all its glory. The shortgrass prairie ecosystem is one of the major ecosystems of America's iconic Great Plains. 
American Prairie plans to reintroduce 10,000 bison into their reserve, making this easily the largest wild bison herd on the planet. They also plan on reintroducing 40,000 elk, as well as thousands of other animal species part of the shortgrass prairie ecosystem, such as pronghorns, badgers, coyotes, and more. These other species will benefit from the increased nutrition and diversity of the grass species resulting from the bison's grazing habits. Lots of agricultural fences are being taken down all throughout the area as well to allow these wild animals to run freely for miles. Running up to 60 miles per hour, pronghorn can get injured or even killed from running into fences. American Prairie is trying to recreate a fully intact ecosystem, so introducing large predators such as mountain lions, wolves, and grizzly bears isn't out of the question. These predators have been an important part of the shortgrass prairie ecosystem for thousands of years. However, many people are not too fond of seeing their numbers increase in the state of Montana, and understandably so. I think it's easy for city folks like myself to say that we need predators back when we don't ever have to deal with them in our lives. It's the people living out in the rural areas of the country that have to actually deal with a grizzly bear in their driveway or wolf in their backyard. As president of American Prairie, Sean Garrity said in his appearance at Talks at Google, American Prairie wants to make existing landowners winners in the process of creating this wildlife reserve. They're spending tons of time and money on the social side of this project, and they are not ignoring the people who are not exactly stoked to have large wild animals returning to where they live. American Prairie even plans to pay these ranchers money in various ways for living alongside native predators. I'll admit it, I do want large predators to be reintroduced into this reserve, but I also don't want to ruin anyone's livelihood. The main goal of this grand scale conservation project is to increase species richness and species abundance in a vast chunk of land in hopes that it will begin to sequester carbon into its fertile soils. Without predators keeping populations of herbivores in check and also shaping the behavior of herbivores in the ecosystem, this whole project can turn into one big mess with exploding herbivore populations that overgraze the land causing permanent damage. We have seen this play out in Yellowstone National Park in the past 100 years. When large predators were killed in Yellowstone, elk populations went through the roof. It was so bad that elk reductions had to take place, which is basically the manual killing of elk every winter. What's truly fascinating is how the elk reductions weren't very effective at balancing the ecosystem. It wasn't until gray wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone that the park began to balance out again. By the way, I have a video all about gray wolves on this channel, so go check that out if you haven't already. Essentially, the more complete an ecosystem with all its players, the more functional it is, and thus the more carbon the land can sequester. Healthier plants and healthier soil will suck much more carbon out of the atmosphere than unhealthy plants and unhealthy soil. Also, the creation of an enormous, fully functional ecosystem in the lower 48 is sure to increase ecotourism in the state of Montana. Now I think I should mention that American Prairie does not plan on creating a Jurassic Park type business with animals of the Holocene instead of dinosaurs. What would that even be called? Holocene Park? Nah, just doesn't have a ring to it. The folks at American Prairie don't want to become tycoons. They simply want to do all they can to help the natural world. American Prairie plans to do ecotourism with minimal impact on the reserve. This reserve won't be like a national park. The needs of nature are going to take priority over the needs of people, and that's how it should be because regardless of its size, it's still a wildlife reserve at the end of the day. There will be only one road running straight through the reserve, and that is it. The rest of the land is for animals to roam and live their lives as naturally as possible. There will be places to stay, and you can check these places out right now on American Prairie's website. In fact, even though American Prairie is not even halfway to buying all the land and filling it with animals, the incomplete reserve is open to visitors right now. Now you might be thinking, but wait, won't 10,000 bison produce a lot of methane, which is even worse than carbon? Guess what? On top of all the other advantages bison have over cattle, bison also produce less methane than cattle. It's as if God is saying, ha, nice try, but my system is the only system. For those who don't know, humans essentially created the domestic cow through thousands of years of selective breeding of the great auroch, a huge wild Eurasian bovid that is now extinct. Not that domestic cows are bad or anything, they're just not as wild and not as natural a fit for the American landscape as bison are. American Prairie has been piecing land together since 2004. I emailed American Prairie asking how much land they have acquired so far to reach their goal of 3.2 million acres, and they replied back letting me know that, at the time of this video, they have acquired 455,840 acres of land. In other words, it's been nearly 20 years and the wonderful folks over at American Prairie are not even close to their goal of 3.2 million acres. 
Land acquisition has been slow, partly due to how in Wyoming, the biggest obstacle to managing bison as wildlife is controlling brucellosis, and understanding how this disease may cause issues for American Prairie's nature reserve. Brucellosis is a disease caused by the bacterial genus Brucella. It infects wild animals such as bison, deer, and even humans can become infected with brucellosis if they're in contact with animals or animal products that have it. Elk are far more likely to spread brucellosis to cattle than bison are. In fact, there has never been a recorded case of brucellosis from Yellowstone bison spreading to cattle. However, with such a diversity of animals being reintroduced into American Prairie's reserve, this disease must be kept in check if the reserve is to be a success. There are only four places left on Earth to even attempt a project of this scale on a grassland ecosystem. The Mongolian Steppe, the Patagonian Steppe, the Kazakh Steppe, and the Northern Great Plains of the USA. American Prairie has undertook a conservation project of epic proportions, and I hope the vision of this organization comes to pass as soon as possible. You can help this vision turn into a reality by donating to American Prairie's website. The link is in the description of this video. Some of the most overlooked ecosystems on Earth are grassland ecosystems. The U.S. grasslands are often referred to as prairies. At first glance, they look like vast expanses of nothing but open land with no trees. But in this video posted by PBS Terra, it is mentioned that there is more biological diversity per square meter of tall grass prairie than in some tropical forests. Samuel Fullendorf, Regents Professor at Oklahoma State University, studies grassland ecology on a regular basis and has come to find that the roots of these tall grasses go 15 feet deep into the soil. These grasses lock tons of carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. Samuel Fullendorf and Oklahoma State University are trying to understand and restore these tall grass prairies and get them functioning as they did in the past. They're doing this by trying to mimic the ecological balance that once existed in grasslands all over the planet. Prior to European settlers arriving in North America, the tall grass prairie ecosystem used to stretch across 14 states, from Texas to Canada. These biologically diverse lands were the beating heart of the continent and contain millions of bison, elk, wolves, and many other species. Settlers decimated the tall grass prairies with their plows so they could farm their crops. Today, only 5% of the tall grass prairies that once covered an enormous chunk of North America remains. The tall grass prairie preserve in Oklahoma, owned by the Nature Conservancy, is the largest chunk of protected tall grass prairie left on Earth, and it's being kept alive ecologically by bison. 300 bison were reintroduced onto the preserve in 1993, and now that number has grown to 2,500 bison. This preserve isn't exactly a bison farm, it's more of an ecosystem. The people that run the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve respect the wildness of the bison and try to maintain the herd's health so they can function optimally on the prairie like they did in the wild centuries ago. The constant grazing by bison may seem like it's causing harm to these grasses, but that's exactly what these grasses need to thrive. Bison and American prairies have evolved together over the course of thousands of years. Bison keep certain plant populations on the prairie under control, which in turn allows the right ones to flourish. Whether they know it or not, one thing is for certain. Bison are truly ecosystem engineers. Prairie ecosystems evolved with grazing animals, primarily bison. So if it is to be restored back to its natural state, there needs to be bison. Which is why ongoing efforts to reintroduce genetically pure bison into areas that would benefit from their presence are crucial for the natural world. Efforts such as American Prairie's Wildlife Reserve which, if all goes accordingly, will recreate a large piece of the legendary shortgrass prairie ecosystem. A lost piece of America's Serengeti. We need Earth's biomes, including its grasslands, to be as strong as they can be as we head into this future of environmental uncertainty. Without them, we cannot win the battle against climate change and environmental destruction. It may not be possible to reintroduce bison to all of their native lands, but well-organized projects such as the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Oklahoma and American Prairie's Wildlife Reserve in Montana will allow us to understand how specific ecosystems work and how they can be managed through real-world experience. We can then use that knowledge to recreate ecosystems elsewhere or build upon ones that have shrunk considerably from their former glory. Even farming bison and managing cattle in a wilder and more natural way will have tremendous ecological benefits. Not to mention the meat will be a lot healthier for the consumers. It's truly a win-win for the environment and for human health. I plan on creating an entire video about the benefits of farming bison and cattle in natural ways, so stay tuned for that. If you want to be notified of its release, make sure you not only subscribe, but also hit the bell button.
If we don't head in this direction, the direction of healing damaged natural areas and working with nature, our future is quite dark. It's the 21st century. Humans are the most consciously powerful species in the world, and I believe that with great power comes great responsibility. We must move toward the direction of regenerative agriculture and working with nature instead of exploiting it. If humans can do amazing things like go to the moon, split the atom, and create the iPhone, I know for a fact that we can also help dying ecosystems and resurrect ecosystems that have vanished by reintroducing native animals. As Americans, I think it is our duty to manage bison as wildlife in an ecologically sound manner. Although bison are dangerous, I think the general public needs to just be more aware of their existence and the existence of the natural world, along with its inner workings. With all the comforts and technological advancements of civilization, a great disconnect between modern society and nature has emerged. The consequences of this disconnect can already be seen in Gen Z people. But I think once people realize how important it is to have all the pieces of an ecosystem, including animals that are potentially dangerous, I think they will then lack the ignorance required to approach a bison and get injured. It's not just Gen Z either. Heck, I'm Gen Z. What I'm saying is that we need to just be more connected to nature as a nation overall. Regardless of who we are, everyone depends on nature. I hope this video has strengthened your understanding of how bison impact their ecosystems. I have no doubt in my mind that with enough knowledge, anyone can come to love nature, along with all the pieces of its systems, including the legendary bison. Hope you enjoyed the video guys um if you did please give it a quick like these these types of videos they take a long time to make since they require me to watch a lot of informative videos on the internet um and on youtube and watch these nature documentaries and read these books on the subject matter of my videos like i'm reading right now right now i'm reading these books right right here if you want to pause your screen this is wild new world by dan flores american serengeti by dan flores american buffalo by stephen ranella and a sand county almanac by aldo leopold and that is not even that is not even a tenth of how many books i have right now that i'm reading for for these youtube uh, videos so i'm gonna try to make some shorter videos so there isn't such a big gap and so that i don't keep you guys waiting for too long i don't want to keep you guys waiting for too long so i'm trying to make around 10 minute ish videos 12 minutes max but sometimes just get carried away and i just i want to talk about so many things you know and so like this bison video turned nearly into a 40 minute video so yeah i gotta try to make some shorter videos but uh yeah let me know in the comments how i did on this one this bison documentary that you just watched let me know if i got anything wrong uh, i'm not perfect but i am always looking for ways to improve my videos and and anything i do so give me all the constructive criticism you can give but by the way i know that this whole setup could be improved I'm, I'm using my phone give me a break i'm i am saving up for dslr but anyways if you really enjoyed this video and you want to be notified when i release my grizzly bear documentary video that i'm currently working on make sure to subscribe and hit that bell button please let me know in the comments what other types of videos you'd want to see from me you can even just name an animal or an aspect of ecology and if i'm interested enough in it i'll do the research i'll read the books and i'll try to make a video about it all right guys until next time and remember Keep it wild. And remember, keep it wild. And remember, keep it wild. See, I really, I really want to end it with my fist hitting the camera, but if I do that, that's my last chance because it'll change the angle. So I don't know what to do. Keep it wild. Keep it wild. And remember, keep it wild.